So, hey, let's all stand together. Turn to the person to your left. Say, you're going to be blessed tonight. Well, you guys said more than you're going to be blessed. You're starting a dialogue or something. What are you, claiming promises over people or something? I love it. I love it. Beautiful. Boy, there's some joy in this room tonight. Do you you sense that? Yeah. You know, I was saying to the worship team, one of the cool things growing up for me is when uh, we moved all over the place, but we used to live on a farm in Alabama. And I remember the time where I would go feed the pigs, how excited they were, the energy in the room. <laughs> oh, I didn't say that. Is that what you're getting from that analogy? Hey, we're redeemed pigs from the pits, of the, the mud pits, right? Praise God. Yes, absolutely. Oh, man. I love you guys. I do. You guys are awesome. Father, thank you so much for just reaching us when we were unreachable by anyone else. We acknowledge that you are the God who sees everything. Lord, that was the message that we got Sunday when you told Thomas, here's the holes in my hands inside, that even when he couldn't see you, you could see him. You could hear him. So we know, Lord God Almighty, that you're in this room. We might not see you with our physical eye or hear you audibly with this ear of flesh, but we know you're here and we know you're speaking. And it's our desire, Lord, to not shut you out, not turn a spiritual eye from you, But to seek you, Lord, you tell us if we will seek you, we will find you. And it's your desire that we would hear what the Spirit would say to the church, Lord. So God, reveal yourself to us tonight. Break down any barriers and walls and towers that we've built. Anything we've justified with spiritual overtones, Lord, that really is not from you. We desire you'd prophesy to your people tonight. We pray this, Father, for your pleasure because you are a shepherd that feeds your flock. Blessed be your name, God. In Jesus' name, everybody said? Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Genesis. Chapter 16, verse 1, we pick up in our study, and the scripture says, now, stop there. This is going to be a long chapter. It's important when you read a therefore, why is it, of course, therefore, and when you read a now, well, now what? What just happened? Well, a lot's happened in the life of Abraham, and I don't know about you, but I am digging this story. I mean, I love the book of Genesis, but the story of Abraham, someone who worshipped the moon and was oblivious of God. God called him out of his pagan Babylonian worship. It's by grace that we're saved, amen? It's not that we chose God, he chose us, amen? Man, so God chose Abraham and gave him promises. And do you know that that's what happens? You know, God calls us and he gives us promises, He says, for I know the plans I have for you, and I'm not going to hurt you. I'm not going to terrorize you. I want to bless you. I promise you it's going to happen. And he calls, just like he called Abraham, I promise you, Abraham, hey, I just, you need to leave, though. You need to leave this pagan land and all that you're comfortable with and all that you put your security in, and you need to leave. And same thing with us. You know, we did that. And, of course, like Abraham, we decided to take a little detour into Egypt. It's called backsliding, (laughs) Right? And we, we, we watched him do that and paid the price for it. And he's been through some different battles, family issues with Lot, his nephew. And, but last week rocked. It says now. Well, what happened was the Lord met him and had this Abrahamic covenant with him that he said, Abram, 
or Abram, how you pronounce that, but Abram, I'm going to make your descendants more than the stars of the sky and all the grains of sin on the seashore, more than that. Now that's a cool promise in my book. And I love the way the Lord spoke to him as Abram sat there and had this sacrifice and the two pieces of meat. And, and as he would, supposed to, as was customary to stand in the pieces of these two pieces of meat where the river of blood flowed. And the two people would meet right in the middle of this place saying, I'm going to keep my end of the covenant. And you're going to keep your end of the covenant. And we're going to have a covenant. We're going to join in a partnership. And beautiful. We read last week that this beautiful symbolism of this fire came and came from the beginning of the sacrifice to the end of it. In other words, the message was, Abraham, you can't keep this covenant. I'm going to be the one to keep it. You can't meet me halfway and do your part and I'll do my part. This is not a partnership of the salvation. This is my work, not your work, Abram. I like that a lot. Some great things are going on is, and beautiful symbolic pictures of, of our present day salvation that we have with our Lord Jesus Christ, the covenant that we have, the new covenant that we have with him. And Abram has this promise, and interesting, his, nut, his name, Abram, if you're writing this down, it means exalted father. Abram, exalted father. God says, hey, exalted father, I'm going to give you an heir, and I'm going to give you descendants, a race more than, but yet, here he's a guy who has no kids. Now, the promise was given to him you know, 10 years prior to this chapter we're about to read. 10 years have passed since chapter 15 and chapter 16. So God gives this promise back in chapter 12 and 13. We're going to give you this land and you're going to possess the land. Oh, that's a great promise, Lord. And he gives him another promise. Hey, you're going to have kids. I know Mr. Abram exalted father. And in your culture, it's kind of humiliating to not have any kids. And here you're really a senior citizen and you have no kids. That would be weird to have a name that kind of prided yourself in being a dad, and yet you had no children. But that's the lot, no pun intended, that Abram had at this time. And it says here, as he's waiting on this promise, 10 years are going by. Now, you know, of course, the story of Sarai and Hagar. And what's it we're about to read? But understand the context of the now that we just read, that 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 Abram is this man called out of the land of the Babylonians to worship and follow God and recognize he's the one who completes the covenant. He's the one who does the work, and he's a God, he's a dad who makes promises and he keeps them. But isn't it true that when God makes promises, boy, we get tested just like a farmer when he plants a seed, don't we? I mean, this was Abram's heart desire to not only have the name of being exalted father, but to be a dad. <laughs> and a decade's going by, and and you know the story, he tries to help God out. It doesn't work out too good, does it? But many times that's how we come to an end ourselves as God tells us something's going to happen. And can we wait upon the Lord that he will do what he's going to do? Well, we're tested in this all the time. And, and, well, Abram's in the thick of this test. So with that said, chapter 16, verse 1. Now, Sarai... Abram's wife had borne him no children, and she had an Egyptian maidservant whose name was Hagar, which means flight. So Sarai said to Abram, see now, the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. Please go into my maid. And that's exactly what it sounds like. Children, please go into, I lost, please go into my maid. Perhaps I shall obtain children by her. So Abram heeded the voice of Sarai. Stop there. Now, before you read this and go, Abram, you dirty dog, understand that this was actually a cultural thing that took place that was not some weird, kinky thing that was going on. See, it was actually customary. Now, when I say customary, I mean in the Babylonian culture. It was Customary in that culture that if a woman could not bear a child, that the maidservant of the wife of the master, he, she could actually take that maidservant and bring her to the master, pay, take her hand, put it on the master and say, go for it. Now, when I read that the first time, like maybe some of you here today, I'm like, that's insane. And I'm imagining Abraham 
What a poor guy, huh? Sure, honey. Okay, I'll do whatever you want to do. Well, he, he justified it again because the culture said to do it. Do you know, just because it might seem okay to do something, that doesn't make it okay to do it. Well, it's legal. I mean, let's take abortion, for example. That's legal, and we live in a culture that the majority says it's okay. Does that mean it's okay? See, we get tested in all kinds of things in our life to actually go, okay, Lord, you've given me a promise, and... uh, You know, I'm going to justify it. And and make no mistake about it, he could have justified it because there in chapter 12 where God gives him the promise, he tells him, through your body, you will produce an heir. He didn't say anything about Sarai. So he could have said, well, you know, he didn't actually use Sarai's name, so he could have met Hagar. It's been 10 years. Maybe I'm not doing something right. When I look at, relationships today, and I look at marriages the way they are, and I'm not talking about the world because the divorce rates are the same in the churches they are in the world. Now, is that whack or what? But a big reason it's that way is because we conform to the standards of this culture of this world versus conforming ourselves to the image of Christ, right? And we get ourselves in trouble. I see so many people going, well, God, you promised me that I'd have an abundant life. And it ain't working out so abundant. God, you promised me I'd have that perfect wife. And I, what, do, what do I got to do here? Maybe if I go to Christian.com, I saw that commercial the other day. And I think that's the Holy Spirit. You know, that wasn't around when you made the promise, but maybe that you're, you brought that into reality here in our culture just to fulfill the promise you gave me, Lord. There's lots of things we do to try and help God out. You know God doesn't need our help. (laughs) I mean, he doesn't give us a promise so we can actually self, you know, uh, fulfill it. It's kind of like when he gave the promise of the Holy Spirit. He didn't say, now go there and memorize as much of the Torah as you can. Help as many people in the poor as you can. He said, I'm going to give you a promise. Now I want you to what? Work for it. No, that's not what he said. What did he say? Wait for it. What do you do when you're waiting? You wonder how long you got to wait. That's what you do when you wait. That's the first thing you do. Well, how long? (laughs) I mean, I got a schedule here, God, and, you know, I got my agenda. I want want our agendas to fit together, right? We, we We want the promise, and we want God's agenda because we kind of know he's creator and we're but dust. So, yeah, but we still want to mix ours in there, and that's kind of what Abraham and Sarai and Hagar are doing and mixing it together. That's why we see relationships the way they are today, even in the body of Christ. That's why we see people getting divorced. That's why we see people getting divorced and being remarried and fornicating and adultery and compromise because we go, well, hey, everybody else is doing it, so why don't we do it too? It doesn't work out. Do you know that? Compromise never works out. There's a, there's a thing called the ripple effect. You know, a lot of times we look at a decision to kind of help God out and do our own thing. It's kind of like throwing a little one-inch rock in the water. It's just a one-inch rock. It's going to sink to the bottom. No one will ever know. But the problem is the ripple effect that goes on, right? And it goes way beyond anything that we can plan. Like we're about to read, took place with this compromise. Man, the ripple effect, we're still seeing it on the news today. We're seeing the ripple effect on the news from this very decision. Incredible. Incredible. And we think, well, it doesn't matter. It's just a little bit of compromise. And again, everyone else is doing it. I see so many other people in the church compromising and doing it. It's a cultural thing. It's okay. And by the way, my God loves me, and he's a God of grace. Yep. (laughs) He loves you, and he's a God of grace. But that doesn't mean there's not a ripple effect. Check it out. God will not be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. Ladies, that goes for you too. And that's what we're reading here. So here, the compromise is going on. Now you say, Dave, but isn't that your interpretation? It's a compromise? Well, I've just read the rest of the story. I hope you have too. 
And, and so that's how I know it was a compromise. It wasn't what God wanted to do. Well, let's continue to read to see what happens. Verse 3, then Sarai, Abram's wife, took Hagar, her handmaid, the Egyptian, and gave her to her husband, Abram, to be his wife. After Abram had dwelt in ten years in the land of Canaan, so he went into Hagar, and she conceived. And when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress, mistress became despised in her eyes. Stop there. Already there's problems in the home front. And guys, I can't help but look at the irony of this whole thing. Think about this. Abram backslid, went into Egypt, and told Pharaoh, hey, this is my wife, and Sarai, I want you to lie about it. Right? Remember that? Now, Abram was already a rich guy, but he got even more rich. And one of the ways he got rich was more servants. Guess who was one of those servants he got rich with? Hagar, which is a Hebrew name. They changed her name to Hagar, which means flight. We'll get to that in a minute. But check it out. Here, again, this is what's ironic. Now you've got the tables of turn where now Sarai is going to Abraham and saying, I want you to go into Egypt, kind of in a so to speak way. And I want you to compromise. And I want you to go down this road. And once he did, what took place? Sarai, which means contention, sits there and gets upset and now is having problems with Hagar. <laughs> oh my gosh. Verse five, then Sarai said to Abram, here we go, here's the big boom. My wrong be upon you. This could be a marriage study for sure. I gave my maid into your embrace and when you saw that she had conceived, I became despised in her eyes. The Lord judged between you and me. Now, wait a minute. Are you as confused as I am? I mean, more than likely, what took place, think about this. Here, you've got Abram wanting God's promise. Sarai is being used, her contentious little self, to kind of sway Abram to go down the wrong road. And here, and see, again, it was a cultural thing, which they believed that once the child was born, at, you know, from the maidservant, that that child would actually belong to Sarai. It didn't belong to Hagar anymore. I mean, they actually had this ritual, which kind of freaked out a little bit, but this, when women had babies back then, they didn't lay down. They actually set up when they had babies, okay? And what they would actually do, it, the culture teaches, and historical documents have shown that what happened is the woman would sit down that could not have the baby, and the woman that was having the baby would sit on her lap and have the baby. For real. As a meaning that this child is now passing through my legs, it belongs to me. So here now Sarai is holding this child that's mine, and all of a sudden now there's this contention, which her name means contention, between her and Hagar, and what does she do? Blames her husband. Go back to where it said that Abram listened to his wife. I could get in a lot of trouble with this one. Abram failed as a leader here. Now, I'm not going to take this text and go, guys, you're insane if you listen to your wife by any means because God speaks through our wives. God speaks through our husbands. God speaks to people. But ultimately, when God speaks to us through people, it's supposed to be a confirmation of what we're sensing in our spirit he's saying to us, not that they're our God and we take our direction from them. Does that make sense? Well, see, Abram had gotten direct leadership from God in a very cool way. I mean, Jesus Christ in physical form, Melchizedek, remember that part of the story? Actually met him face to face and talked with him, the prince of peace, the prince of king of righteousness. Man, this is incredible. And yet now he's taking direction from miscontentious and it's coming back to bite him. He's compromising. He's growing impatient with waiting on the will and the timing of God. See, this whole process of waiting on the promises of God is teaching us a lot of things. It's teaching us to not trust in our flesh. It's teaching us that God is faithful and true and that he's sovereign. He'll do things when he deems them the right timing to do them. Now, the test that he's going through here with Sarai, let's see how he responds as she throws out her spiritual abuse about let God uh, judge between you and I. 
It says here, verse six, so Abraham said to Sarai, indeed, your maid is in your hand. So he passes the buck. <laughs> he, says, I, he says, this is a headache. I am not dealing with this. Do to her as you please. And when Sarai dealt harshly with her, she fled from her presence. Stop there. So Abram, again, having the opportunity to be a leader in his home, instead he says, you know what? This is a headache. You're senile. You're out of your mind, Sarai. First you want me to go ahead and have sex with your because you have a baby and you're humiliated, and then I do it. Now you're not happy with that. I, I, it's a catch-22. There's no winning with you. You ever feel that way with your spouse? Well, here Sarai now tries to pass the buck. Now, there's a couple ways to look at this scripture. It could be a matter of that, Abram's doing the right thing, saying, hey, listen, your problem is not with me. I don't want to hear about it. You need to go deal with that person directly, right? Now, we know that Sarai does not handle it. She dealt harshly with Hagar, so she didn't actually deal with it the right way. So we really can't know whether he was doing the right thing in a Matthew 18 sense or a matter of being a failure as a leader. But here's the thing what I've learned is that when your wife comes to you, man, I'm speaking to you, When your wife comes to you and she's having a battle and she's losing it, don't abandon her because it's a headache to you. And that's what, I mean, I'll be the first one. I've done that, right, honey? I've done that before. (laughs) Absolutely, but there's a place where you're going, you know what? This isn't about right or wrong. This is about my spouse and she's crying out for help and I'm gonna come in and bring spiritual leadership here. Now that's where... Abram blew it. He, again, this is a headache. You're a dripping faucet, and I'm not going to deal with this. Abram, you see how one compromise just begets another? Think about this. This all started because he backslid and went to Egypt and got a slave named Hagar. Because of that one choice to go down the road God did not call him to go on, bred all this that we're reading about. Just that one compromise that could have been justified. Well, we need, hey, we need supplies, you know. <sighs> we need to go to Egypt. I know God didn't call us to go there, but he didn't say, don't go there. Yeah, that's how I'll compromise that. He didn't tell me, don't go to Egypt. It should be implied, though, when you're leaving a land of pagan worship to not go to another one. What do you think? But he justified it somehow, and as that little justification bred all this that's going on with a compromise. And this is just the tip of the iceberg we're about to read about. This whole phrase of no compromise, let me tell you what, God doesn't want us to not compromise because he's this legalist in the sky and bonk, bonk on the head whenever we leave his standards. He's watching out for us because he doesn't want that ripple effect to come and rip our household apart. He doesn't want that ripple effect to come and ruin our testimony. I mean, we've got a testimony, right? The world's looking at our Christianity and going, Are this, is this another one of those hypocrites? Another one of those that, yeah, they love God, they've heard God, they've got covenant with God, they, they walk with the Lord, they've seen miracles, they pray in tongues, they prophesy, they do all this, they dance at church, but they also live like a Babylonian too. They also love to go to Egypt as well. And the world is just dying to find those people so they can justify hardening their hearts to a relationship with God. You see the spiritual agenda that's going on. And whenever we compromise, just that little pebble in the water. See, what I don't want to do is is somehow convey that, that we're under law and that if we blow it, man, God's so mad at us and our life is ruined. No, God works all this out for good. He's a big God, you know. But I don't but I don't want to look at things and go, wow, because God works out things for good because he displays a child of law to contrast a child of grace because he displays in his sovereignty a child of flesh and a vessel made for destruction and common purposes versus a child for noble purposes, Romans 9 through 11. Just because he does that with his sovereignty with these two doesn't justify the pebble in the water. Well, God works all things out for good. He understands. He loves me. Yeah, you can say that and you're right. He'll work it out. But there's going to be pain. There's going to be problems as a result of that. The Lord wants to spare. He can work things out just fine without your compromise. You think? We don't have to run back to Egypt and get a Hagar and have a problem. I'm convinced the problem in our marriages today and all that's going on is not a result of the enemy. We love to blame the devil. Remember Flip Wilson? The devil made me do it. You know, it's like we're still doing that today. 
We, we, we love to have a demon under every rock and blame it all on the enemy. As I've said before, the enemy just sits back with his popcorn, you know, and his candy bars and going, you guys are handling it just fine because you love Egypt and you love compromise. You still love the leeks and onions. You still love the world. You're doing your own thing and you're, you're kind of mixing in the promises of God with you helping them out in the flesh to fulfill them. Doesn't work out. The old saying, if mama ain't happy, nobody's happy. You've heard that before, right? I don't buy that. What I buy is if you try and add on to what God's doing in your life and help him out, you're going to create a nightmare. And you're going to create the contention and problem. Abram was failing as a leader. A spiritual man of God was failing as a leader. So here now we have this situation where this woman who was, well, she was given over to the father who is righteous by faith, right? Given over, and she was a slave in Egypt, and now she's giving birth, and she's being dealt with harshly. So now as she's kicked out of her family and her legacy being crushed, now she's trying to head back to Egypt with Ishmael. Inside, that is. Check this out. Verse 7, what takes place as she fled? It says, verse 7, that now the angel, our messenger of Jehovah, the messenger, this is the first time, rule of first mention is always important in the Bible. The angel of the Lord found her by a spring of water in the wilderness, by the spring on the way to Shur. And she said, and he said, Hagar, Sarai's maid, where have you come from and where are you going? And she said, I am fleeing from the presence of my mistress, Sarai. The angel of the Lord said to her, return to your mistress and submit yourself under her hand. Stop there. The angel of the Lord, guys. This angel of the Lord is none other than the second person of the Trinity. This, whenever you see that in the scripture, that's a picture of Jesus showing up. And he's been doing that since the Garden of Eden coming out of Christophany in physical form. And here the Lord is showing up and another one, another time a showing of Jesus meeting a woman. Just like when he rose from the dead, who did he meet? A prostitute, right? And now here he's meeting a slave from Egypt whose life has been crushed and she's been used and abused and kicked out. Now, no doubt, Hagar was handling things wrong and causing dissension with this contentious woman, Sarai. But here she's Egypt, a slave, and the Lord reaches out to her. That blows my mind. We continue to see the grace of God in the Old Testament in ways that continually just make me scratch my head and go, God, you are so amazing. I mean, here you have Abram, who was a pagan worshiping moon god. The God says, I'm going to reach out to you when you're not even crying out to me. And then he says, now I'm going to reach out to a slave in Egypt who doesn't worship me, and I'm going to reach out to her. I love the way John Wesley, he interprets the scripture. If I, if I can quote this right, but something that I had read that he had said, he says, without any voice of devotion, the God of pity hears the voice of affliction. That's good, isn't it? I mean, he's reaching out to her because, well, as she's about to see, God sees everything. He cares. See, many times we think, well, God cares about the leadership of the church, and he cares about Mother Teresa, and he cares about missionaries. No, he cares about people that are pagans, and they worship themselves in the flesh, and they don't acknowledge God at all because God for so loved the world that he gave. He loves everybody. Come on, somebody say amen to that. He loves everybody, and he loves this slave. And he's reaching out to her. But you know what he tells her to do? He tells her to go back to Sarai and work this out and submit to the authority that I have in your life. Now, see, we like the idea of God reaching out to us in our lack of devotion, our lack of sensitivity to following his plan or even walking with him and, and showing us grace and rescuing us in the midst of this desert. And understand, she was on a one-way trip, meaning she never would have made it to Egypt. She would have died in the desert. If you look on a map, there's no way she would have made it. God saved her life here. And he says, hey, if you really want to experience blessing, I want you to go back, and this authority that I've put in your life, I want you to go deal with it. See, many times authorities that we have in our life, even when they're contentious, even when they're wrong, they can be ordained by God. Do you know that? But we're just reading that right now. 
So God says, I want you to go back to Sarai, and I want you to work this issue out. So if you're at that place where you're going, man, I want the promises of God in my life, and I want intimacy with God, and I want power of the Holy Spirit in my life, could it be that there's some type of disconnect between you and God because there's some type of authority in your life that you justifiably they did something that's wrong, but you still dishonored the authority that God gave them in your life? I can, I'm convinced it's one of the greatest stumbling blocks the enemy brings into seasoned saints' lives. See, it's not, it's not so much common in new births because usually new births, new believers, born-again Christians that, hey, I'm just wanting to follow Jesus, they usually have a little bit more of a humility about them. They don't know the Bible that well. They haven't experienced that much, that kind of glory in their life. And so there's a little more humility in their life. So they, they have a tendency to submit to authority more, even when it's wrong. And, uh, but what happens is after a while, Christians start to experience some of that anointing, some of the spiritual gifts, some spiritual authority in their, li- in their own life. And all of a sudden, they see the abuse of authority, and they stand up against it in the sense of like, hey, you know what? That's wrong, and I'm going to dishonor this relationship that God has had. Versus saying, I care more about the relationship than who's right or wrong. I want unity because that's what the Lord loves here. He loves unity, right? That's what he's after. Not who's right or who's wrong because Bottom line is we're probably both wrong. <laughs> I'm wrong about this, but you're wrong about that, and you're right about that, and I'm right about this. Wait a minute, let's just put that aside, and let's acknowledge and honor the relationship that God has put here and honor him through it. If more people did that, less divorces would be taking place, right? I mean, think about this. God says, Abram, Sarai, I'm going to have you married. Yeah, Sarai, I'm going to give you a guy who trades you off to Pharaoh because he's afraid of losing his own skin and lie about you. That's not too cool. That's the kind of husband God gave Sarai? Oh, yeah. Oh, and Abram, I'm going to give you a wife who kind of coerces you to having sex with a handmaiden, you know, that, that hottie from Egypt, and then she's going to burn you and make you miserable as a result of things she told you to do. Lord, the woman you gave me. <laughs> like what, he, what, he said, what Adam said to God, it's not my fault, it's the woman you gave me, Lord. So God gives us even spouses that are on crack, it seems like, at times. What are you thinking? The Lord says, I want you to work this out. I want you to love each other. I want you to resolve the relationship and honor the God-given relationship and the authority that I sovereignly put there for my will to be done in and through you. Abram and Sarai worked it out. And he told Hagar, "If, if you want blessing, you need to go back and resolve this. But so many people don't do that. And why do we have to when we have a church on every corner? Hey, if I don't like the way that church is doing that, you know what? That's, yeah, they're just not in the spirit. They don't have the anointing. They did, but they don't have the anointing anymore. And, and after all, Pastor Dave, I've heard that illustration so many times. Can you give me something new, please? The worship teams need some new songs. And my gosh, it's always so cold in here. There's like one, thing, one thing after another. The music's too loud. That's why we got earplugs back there. Stuff them in. Because as soon as we turn it down, someone else goes, I can't hear it good enough. There's always one thing after another where we go, wait a minute. What are we do? Well, we don't have to because you know what? There's so many churches around. We can continue not to honor the authority God puts in our life. And we do that with churches. We do that with marriage. We do that with jobs. We do it all over the place. And meanwhile, we're not entering into the promised land, the blessings. We're not crossing over. You hearing this? This is good stuff. I like it. I didn't plan on sharing that. That's good. (laughs) That makes a lot of sense to me. It's always a good thing to take stock of your past relationships and go, where have I dishonored the authority that you put in my life, God? And I need to go back, and I need to find sweet unity in that. I need to pray. I need to fast. I need to die to myself. Yeah. I need to stop loving my self-righteous spirit and pulling my Bible, performing spiritual abuse, ironically the very thing I'm accusing them of. Mm. Yeah, put that in your pipe and smoke it. Here we go. Verse 10, Then the angel of the Lord said to her, I will multiply your descendants exceedingly, well, here's a cool promise, so that they shall not be counted for multitude. And the angel of the Lord said to her, Behold, you are with child, 
and you shall bear a son, and you shall call him, you shall name him Ishmael, which means God shall hear. So here we know she's walking through this desert, pregnant, and he wants you to have him and say, God shall hear. Why? Well, because the Lord has heard your affliction. So, so far, this is a good thing. God says, hey, you're pregnant, you're going to have a baby, it's a beautiful thing, and matter of fact, your descendants, they're going to increase exceedingly. However, verse 12 says, he shall be a wild man. Some of you are going, I got one of those. (laughs) He shall be a wild man, his hand shall be against every man, and every man's hand against him, and he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. Stop there. So hear what we just read. As God says, you're going to have a son. I want you to name him God Hears because I want you to know, hey, God, I'm hearing you. But, however, this son, Ishmael, this wild donkey in some versions it calls him, he's going to produce a people that are always going to be at war. Now, if you look at Job chapter 39, Job talks about this people, this basically this Arab nation that's causing problems and like, Lord, why? Well, the reason why is God allowed this for a sovereign reason. I kind of learned that earlier. If you look at Romans 9, 10, and 11, and and, in your homework, do this. Read Romans 9, 10, and 11, and also look at Galatians 4. Paul talks about what God was doing in the big picture by allowing this in his sovereignty. He did this as an allegory, a word picture to us to say, hey, I'm sovereign. And I want there to be a picture of law and grace. Ishmael, child of the flesh, that is the picture of law and a picture of the earthly Jerusalem. Isaac, which means laughter, rejoicing, he's a child of the spirit. And he pictures grace and the new Jerusalem coming down from heaven. One is obtained as being an heir of such by the flesh and works, and one you become an heir by faith alone. God allowed this. So it's an incredible picture that God knew, being the sovereign, eternal God that he is, to be a word picture to us. However, one thing that we can't ignore is, again, the ramifications of compromise. I mean, recent last couple of days, if you watch the news at all, you're going, Wow, Jerusalem is being nailed with missiles from the Hamas. Where do you think the Arabs, the Hamas, Iran, Iraq, where do you think they all came from? From one decision. One decision. When Abram said, let's go to Egypt. Let's go to Egypt. And then came Hagar. And then came Ishmael. And then came the Palestinians, or the Philistines, the Palestinians. Then came all the animosity and the contention contention you see today between Israel and the surrounding enemies are all descendants of Ishmael. All because of one decision. Mind-blowing. I mean, I, I'm getting ready for the study yesterday, and, I, and I'm reading through the scriptures and praying, and I, I turn on the news, and I'm looking at these rockets going, and I'm going, This is because of Genesis 16 that this is going on. Wow. Ripple. Big ripple. Not just a 20, 30 foot ripple, but thousands of feet ripple effect that people are dying as a result because of one compromise. And you think, well, it's just one compromise. It doesn't really matter. We're not hurting anyone. Abram, we're just going to Egypt. It, who are we hurting? Jerusalem, Hamas. Well, it's Hagar, and it's a customary thing. Go have intercourse with her and kind of help God out. What's it going to hurt? Everyone else is doing it. Jerusalem, Hamas. All because of a compromise. So the Lord is not some legalist in the sky saying, Walk in the light. Walk as my son walked. Don't compromise. You know, he's not saying that because we're still at Mount Sinai because God understands the ripple effect. Now, will he work that out for good? Absolutely. That's like the guy who says, well, I know I must be unequally yoked, and she's not saved, and I'm not even, I'm saved, I think, but I'm not really walking, but I'm going to lead her to the Lord, you know, that whole missionary dating thing. And we try and work it out like, well, God, now can God work that out for good? Yeah, yeah, he can work everything out for good. 
But you just want to ignore the ripple effect, don't you? You still want to do it your own way. I, if, you can't, if you can read this scripture and ignore that, you need drugs. You need, you need help. You need to be put in a clinic because you're clearly something's not right with you. And of course, I'm being silly. You actually need deliverance if you want to be serious about it. Because how can you not look at that scripture and go, oh my gosh, all this because Abram wanted to take a pit stop at Egypt and have sex with his handmaiden and listen to his wife instead of listening to God? So I can cause all kinds of problems and generations to come simply by not following God instead of following what my wife says instead of following after what the Lord says? Wow, really? It can be that serious? Or maybe that was just isolated to Abram and Sarai. What do you think? Or do you think it's maybe a principle of truth? Wow. Well, here after she gets this insight from Jesus Christ himself, what's going on, this is beautiful. We'll end here tonight. It says, Then she called the name of the Lord who spoke to her, You are the God who sees. For she said, have I also here seen him who sees me? Therefore, the well was called Ber Laharoi. Observe, it is to be between Kadesh and Bered, which is still there today, this well. So Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram named his son, whom Hagar bore Ishmael. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore Ishmael to Abram. Here Jesus, talking to this slave woman, meets her at a well. I love the picture of Jesus bringing, who is the water of life, amen, that comes and says, I'm going to come and bring nourishment to your soul. How can you not think of the story of the woman at the well, right? How can you not think about how Abraham sent the servant a picture of the Holy Spirit to bring the bride to his son, the picture of Christ Jesus, and he found Rebecca where? At a well. You go all through the scriptures, and there's these significant symbolic teachings that come by the well. That word bear, Leroy, that word bear means well. It, Jesus says, I want to come and bring living water to you. Who does he do that to? To a slave. How cool is that? And how picturesque is that, that here you have a slave that was rescued from Egypt, that was rejected by that which would bring a nation who ultimately would become slaves in Egypt, that have been rescued by grace. I mean, this, there's so much continuity in the Bible, it brings your head in a spin at times. It's incredible. And it's all to show us that God sees everything. He sees it all. Now, that can make you really comforted or make you really uncomfortable that God sees everything. Do we really believe God sees everything? I doubt it. A lot of the things that we do, <laughs> if we really believe God was watching, we wouldn't be doing them. We wouldn't. And those things that we're doing usually are things that have ripple effects to them. They're the compromise. Because we think, well, the Lord's not watching. That would have freaked my mind if I was Thomas. And, the, and Thomas was reading, God was reading my mail and repeating the things I said when I didn't see him and going, so you really are omnipresent. You really do see everything. You really do hear everything. You're freaking me out, Lord. This is amazing. What do we do with that? How do we apply that today as night as we close to go, you're the God who sees me. You're the God who hears me. Well, beautiful enough, we have an account of a slave woman being able to give a name to the Lord. I think that is significant. See, when someone gives somebody a name, it's a sign of some type of authority because like, if I have a child, you can't name that child. That's my child. I'll name. If I have a business, you don't name the business. I'm the CEO. I name the business. And here, God is saying, you're going to give me a name or at best at least a title. And the Lord received that from this woman who says, I see the God who sees me. I hear the God who hears me. Now, that's intimacy. That's what, personally, your brother Dave, that's what I'm walking away with the scripture. And if you really believe that you're having a relationship where you see the God who sees you 
and you're hearing the God who hears you, it will inspire you to say, I'm not taking that turn to Egypt. I'm not going to compromise in the flesh. I'm going to learn to wait upon the Lord. Because if he gave a promise, he's going to fulfill it. And I don't need to add or subtract to his word. And that's the whole beauty of Revelation 22. Don't add or subtract to the promises of the things that God said he will do. Because there is a curse that will follow that. Do you understand that? There will. And what do I mean by curse? I don't mean some generational curse. I mean consequence. God is not mocked. Don't think you can drop the rock in the water and there's no ripple effect. There will be. So you want to be inspired to walk the straight and narrow and honor God? It's kind of like if you're walking a minefield. You would only go, hey, I'm an American. I can walk wherever I want to walk. I don't care if somebody's a minefield. Well, then you're an idiot, right? Well, we're walking in a minefield, man. God says, no, there's places it's going to blow up. So walk. don't compromise to the right or left. Walk the straight and narrow, not the broad, destructive road. Walk the narrow road. Do this, and you'll be blessed. If you don't, there's going to be a curse. There's going to be a consequence. There's going to be an explosion. I'll still love you, but you might be in a wheelchair walking around with no legs. Is that what you want? I don't. Is that what you want? So what are we going to do from this? We're going to go, Lord, okay, I get it. You're watching me, and my heart's desire is not to go to Egypt or live in the flesh or compartmentalize, compartmentalize my Christianity and do what I want to do and mix the two together. Instead, I'm going to say, Lord, wherever you say go, I'm going to go. And where you tell me not to, I don't want to mess with that. Even, Lord, if it's really just choking my flesh waiting on you. Abram had to wait 25 years before he held Isaac in his arms. 25 years he waited. Did he compromise? Well, obviously he did. Did God work it out? Obviously he did. Did he have to pull his hair out with that contentious wife quite a bit? Oh, you betcha. Are we still reaping the benefits of his compromise today as we watch today on the news, a woman having a wedding in Jerusalem, and the sirens going off in the middle of their ceremony, they're running off and screaming because there could be a bond that blow everything up? Yeah, watching that today because of this. No more ripples, Amen. Hey, let's all stand together. Father, thank you for this incredible chapter, Lord, where we see that you desire the best for us. Father, thank you for your incredible patience as we learn to wait upon the Lord and knowing you will renew our strength. You will lift us up. Father God, if there be any areas of compromise in our lives in this room, For the most of us, Lord, we really don't need you to reveal them to us. We really already know what they are. It's just they're drugs to us, Lord. They make us feel better. At least it seems that way. So, Father, we're asking that you would give us the strength and the courage to love you and trust you more than we love ourselves or trust ourselves. Father, we want to recommit our resolve to you. And if that means saying no to someone that will reject us, if that means saying no to material blessing in an area, whatever it means, Lord, we want to fo- take up our cross and follow you. We want to repent of that area tonight in the name of Jesus. You have made us not slaves of the flesh, are heirs of the child of flesh, but you've made us slaves to God. Holy Spirit, come and empower us to walk as Jesus walked. Father, we commit this prayer to you. We pray that even over this evening, as we go home, as we lay there in our bed, speak to us as you spoke to Hagar. May we see the God who sees us. May we hear your voice, because Lord, we know you hear ours. And we pray this, Father, in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Amen. Family, God bless you. We'll see you Friday night.